thou art the man by mary elizabeth braddon chapter four a mariage de convenance two and thirty years before that bleak october afternoon on which coralie urquhart discanted in her journal sir joseph higginson of arlington street and ellerslie park startled his friends and neighbours by an by an aristocratic alliance and the bringing home of a lovely girl wife to reign over his country house near ardliston sir joseph was forty-nine years of age at the time of his marriage plain of face and clumsy of figure but he was one of the wealthiest pit owners in the north of england and if his immediate surroundings were surprised at this union society in london regarded the marriage as the most natural thing in life here was the earl of allandale on the one part with a large family the offspring of two poorly dowered wives and here was a millionaire of mature years against whose position nothing could be said except that he had made it for himself and against whose moral character no slander had ever reached the ear of the great world decidedly pronounced society lord allandale had done wisely in uniting his youngest daughter youngest of a family of eleven to sir joseph higginson the young lady herself was never heard to complain whatever dream she had cherished of a different union was a dream that had found its own tearful ending before she saw the lord of those cumbrian pits she was told that her acceptance of sir joseph would be advantageous to her family as well as an assurance of high fortune to herself he could help her brothers some of whom were public officials while the more enterprising of the band dabbled in trade and exhibited their patrician name upon the prospectuses of newly launched companies she as his wife could be useful to her sisters since his spacious mansion in arlington street would offer a better stage for matrimonial efforts than the somewhat shabby old house in mayfair which the mountfords maintained with a struggle and whose chief merit was to be found in certain unsavoury traditions of old-world scandals duels elopements family quarrels forced marriages which clung to the panelled walls of those low-ceilinged rooms in which lord allandale's ancestors had lived and loved and hated and suffered for more than two centuries lord allandale professed an affectionate pride in the house because his family had held it so long but he was fain to confess that it was inconvenient and insanitary and it cost him a plaguy lot of money to keep the roof from tumbling in and the windows from falling out if i were to sell the old gazebo to a pork butcher from chicago he would pull it down and build a little palace on the side or scoop out the inside and restore it in the style of the seventeenth century said his lordship but i shan't part with it while i have a shot in the locker and we must pig in it as best we can pigging was not an elegant expression but it seemed hardly inappropriate 
for the upper floors were divided into bedchambers not much larger than a modern pigsty and of inconvenient shapes for the most part in which the ladies mountford and their honourable brothers were almost as crowded as an irish peasant's household amid the fertile field of Kerry. for compensation they had basingstoke house a great barrack in hampshire on a windy hill westward of basingstoke where there were five and thirty inconvenient bedrooms lady lucy mountford submitted to fate in the person of sir joseph higginson and became at once mistress of the house in arlington street palatial splendid rich in all things that make the outward grace and glory of life and of ellerslie park in cumberland a colossal tudor mansion designed by an architect of the highest fashion who would not suffer the smallest alteration of his plans it had been discovered or at any rate alleged later that the fashionable architect was a fraud that his tudor houses were none of them genuinely tudor but only tudoresque and he had stolen his flashiest ideas from the sober flemings of antwerp and ghent notwithstanding which condemnation from the ever advancing critic who is always getting beyond the perfection of yesterday ellerslie was a remarkable house in a very fine situation with turrets and broad embayed windows that looked wide over land and sea sir joseph owned most of the land to be seen from these windows and he owned a whole district of collieries and colliers cottages which were happily unseen by the inmates of ellerslie which lay in the furthermost dip of the long low hill he was the wealthiest man and the largest landowner in that part of the country and he was not without his enemies no prosperous man ever escapes the hatred of the unsuccessful it is the bright day that brings forth the adder sir joseph was as popular as most county magistrates and employers of labor but it was said of him that he was a hard man and that he never accepted less than twelve pence for his shilling he had begun life as a toiler in those pits of which he was now owner it was said of him that everything he touched turned to gold that he had satan's luck as well as his own but this is an assertion commonly made about every man from whom small beginnings attains to gigantic wealth the world sees only the speculator's success but does not see or at least readily forgets the failures and disappointments that made the game of speculation difficult it keeps no count of the hours of heart sinking when the fortune already won trembled in the balance and when it was only by hazarding all that the game could be saved joseph higginson was talked of as a modern midas and very few people knew or remembered what arduous stages there had been on that long uphill road to the pinnacle of success he knew and remembered that he had been more than once on the verge of bankruptcy and that he had more than once risked the game of life upon a single throw he had shown himself a man of infinite resources keen observation and he was said to have the gift of prophecy in a degree granted to but few 
financiers he had reached the age of forty-nine ostensibly a bachelor and had gratified his nephews and nieces most of whom he had helped to rise considerably from their original status by the assertion often repeated that he would never marry when a chance meeting in the boardroom of an insurance company where he was chairman brought about an acquaintance with lord allandale who was one of the directors your impecunious nobleman is apt to incline toward the low-born millionaire and allandale flattered sir joseph by telling him how much he had heard about his work in the north and how interested he was in seeing the man who had done such good work an invitation to a little dinner at his lordship's house in hartford street followed a few days later it was a man's dinner and sir joseph hardly hoped to see the ladies of the family but four out of the party of six left soon after ten o'clock three to go to the house where there was an important division coming on and the fourth to look in at three or four smart dances whereupon lord allandale proposed an adjournment to the drawing-room i don't know whether you know my wife he said she goes out a good deal more than i do i have met her ladyship at parties but i have never had the honour of an introduction answered sir joseph meekly come up and be introduced now said the earl cheerily sir joseph laid down his half-smoked cigar on the old darby dessert plate he had observed that in noble families however impecunious one always found old china and queen anne silver to excite the envy of the newly rich he laid down his cigar and pulled himself together smoothing down the wrinkles in his white waistcoat he was a stout man short-necked broad-shouldered and always wore a white waistcoat whether the thing were in or out of fashion excellent or intolerable he followed his host up the narrow mayfair staircase which was decorated with those shabby family pictures and engravings of country houses which indicate widespread connections and a long history how different he thought to his staircase in arlington street where all was newly splendid created at a blow by one sweep of the upholsterer's hand here portraits miniatures battle-pieces in which mountfords had figured views of country seats were stuck about anyhow on casual nails the drawing-room low and roomy occupying the whole of the first floor seemed full of women and yet there was no one but lady allandale and her daughters a flock of young women in gauzy white gowns with a general impression of white azaleas and ostrich feathers standing about before the looking-glasses pluming themselves ready for conquest while they waited for the big family carriage that was to take them to a ball they reminded sir joseph of a group of beautiful swans pruning their plumage on the bosom of a summer lake he was lost in admiration of the general effect rather than of individual beauty he could scarcely command his attention while he was being introduced to a large lady in peach-coloured brocade and diamonds who was putting on a glove that seemed decidedly too small for the fat and jewelled hand it was required to cover the hand came out of the glove and offered itself in the friendliest way to sir joseph 
i think sir joseph and i knew each other very well before to-night though we had not been introduced said lady allandale you were sitting next to me at luncheon the day they launched the harmonia i remember and we were near neighbours at lady downton's big dinner-party the other day sir joseph assented smilingly he adored a peeress wherever he met one i had the honour of taking in lady hetherington what amanda my stepdaughter she is always charming let me introduce you to my daughters sir joseph lady selina lady laura lady jane lady rosina the four white swans smilingly accepted the introduction with gracious bendings of slender throats lady selina was the eldest of the brood a very mature swan the room was too dimly lighted to allow sir joseph to note the difference in their ages the mountfords were a race renowned for good looks and to the millionaire's eye the four sisters appeared equally beautiful and then he suddenly perceived a girl sitting at the piano in a pale blue cashmere frock pale blue was a favorite color thirty years ago a girl with her hair swept back from her fair sweet face in a careless bunch of long loose curls tied up with a blue ribbon a girl in whose face and candid eyes looking up at him across the piano he saw a loveliness infinitely beyond the grandiose beauty of the four swans that is my youngest daughter sir joseph said lady allandale following his eyes she has not yet left the schoolroom lady lucy rose shyly embarrassed by the gaze of sir joseph's great brown eyes eyes that reminded her of a friendly ox in basingstoke park she and sir joseph stood looking at each other for a few moments equally embarrassed almost as if some instinct of mind or heart foreshadowed the union of their lives she gave him her hand tremulously under the spell of his earnest gaze or the presage of her fate the youngest of many daughters is doomed to flower late and lady lucy despite her cashmere frock and schoolroom status was nineteen and had her own little history not altogether of the schoolroom a history which gave a touch of pathos to the lily face a lovely young creature but i am afraid she's rather sickly was sir joseph's unspoken commentary he was only allowed ten minutes in this elysium of fashionable Uri. her ladyship's carriage was announced and the white daughters crowded down the staircase followed by the ampler mother on whose footsteps sir joseph and lord allandale attended sir joseph paused on the landing while her ladyship's bulky form was slowly descending and addressed himself in parting speech to the damsel from the schoolroom i'm afraid you must feel very envious of your sisters at such a moment as this lady lucy he said 
I don't see why all girls should be supposed to be fond of dancing, she answered rather pettishly. I don't care about it. And you are not longing for next season, when you will be presented, I suppose? No. Lucy has seen too much of it all from the outside, said Lord Allendale, patting the graceful shoulder in the blue frock. She is disillusioned before her time. Come, Sir Joseph, if you really mean to vote with your party tonight, you'd better be off. Your carriage has been at the door for the last half hour. This was the beginning of Sir Joseph's acquaintance with Lady Lucy Mountfort. They were married early in the ensuing season at the church in Piccadilly, where daffodils were still blooming in the Basingstoke meadows. It was a very grand wedding, and all London talked of the marriage, some people descanting on the cruelty and wickedness of so ill-assorted a union, others expatiating upon the wonderful match Lord Allendale had secured for this portionless youngest, and a third section declaring that he ought to have done better for her. A girl of such remarkable beauty ought to have looked higher than a man who began life in a coal pit, said one of Lady Allendale's dearest friends. But if the man has got out of the pit and made a big fortune in coals, I don't think a woman with five daughters need complain of her luck, said another. A woman with five daughters ought to consider herself lucky when she gets off one of the five, remarked a third matron with some asperity, being herself the mother of an only daughter and a reputed beauty who had been hawked all through England and over half the continent of Europe without satisfactory result. The Allendales were content with their bargain, and so was Sir Joseph. He had taken pains to make himself agreeable to the young lady in every manner that came within the limits of his capacity. He had consulted her tastes and feelings, deferred to her wishes, and let her understand that the life she was to lead with him would be a life of perfect independence and wide liberty she was to be not his slave but his queen she laughed at first at the idea of sir joseph as her adorer and in her girlish talk with her sisters treated the whole affair as a joke but his earnestness and honesty were not without their influence upon her mind and after a long and serious conversation with her mother, in which Lady Allendale lifted the decent veil which had been spread over the financial position of the family, and showed her youngest daughter the bleak and barren prospect which lay before her and her sisters, unless some of them married well and were able to help the others, Lady Lucy gave a resigned sigh and promised that she would try to like sir joseph well enough to marry him lucy adored her mother and was fond of her sisters though they were of the world worldly she had dreamed her dream and had done with with all such dreams for ever she told herself Sir Joseph's rugged honesty of purpose had won her esteem, and if it were indeed her destiny to marry for the welfare of her family, and to lessen the burden upon her father's dwindling income, it would be well for her that she should marry an honest man, whom she could at least respect, love being forevermore impossible she had seen the young men of her mother's circle 
seen them from her privileged position as a young person still in the schoolroom who was free to sit in the background and look on as at a play and she had been impressed by their shallowness and self-assurance she preferred the conversation of sir joseph who sometimes misplaced an aspirate but who always talked sensibly and never pretended to more knowledge than he possessed to the vacuous slaying of youth that had graduated on suburban race courses learnt dancing at after midnight clubs and received its final polish in london music halls when sir joseph after wooing her in his own fashion with supreme delicacy asked her in simplest language to be his wife she answered with a gentle candour which completed his subjugation she told him that she had given her whole heart away a year ago in a happy summer time at basingstoke house given it unasked and almost unaware of her own feelings till she awoke to the bitterness and despair of having loved a man who never wooed her and who was not free to be her lover she told her little story of a girl's romance falteringly and toward the end with tears which she struggled heroically to suppress i am afraid he guessed my wretched secret she said burning blushes suffusing cheek and brow as she sat by sir joseph's side with lowered eyelids one cold and trembling hand clasped in those broad sinewy hands of his which had never lost the markings of early toil i am afraid he read my heart only too well we are distant cousins sir joseph and he was almost as familiar as a brother would have been one day he said very secret seriously that he had a secret to tell me i had seen for ever so long that he was unhappy that the shadow of some hidden grief would creep over him in the midst of our gaiety when everything in life seemed made for happiness i was hardly surprised when he told me that he was a miserable man early in life before he left the university that he had married foolishly that one word was all he ever said to me about his marriage he had never owned that marriage to his people but he had done his duty or at least he hoped he had done his duty to his wife a son was born and soon after his birth the poor mother went out of her mind and then her husband found that there had been madness in her family he had done what was right he assured me he had placed her in the best and kindest care and he had hoped for her recovery although the doctors gave him very little ground for hope years had gone by and the case was now pronounced hopeless her mind was gone but her physical health promised long life there was no such thing as divorce in such a case as this he was her husband to the end of his life did he tell you that he loved you asked sir joseph under his breath no 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 protested the girl eagerly not by one word not by one look then he is a good man and deserves a better fate god reward you my dear for having opened your heart to me i am not afraid to try 
and guard that pure heart from every temptation that can assail an old man's wife if you only like me well enough to trust yourself to my loving care lucy if i am to marry at all i would rather be your wife than any one else's she answered gravely and thus ended sir joseph's courtship from that hour till the last hour of her life lady lucy never complained of her portion in this world sir joseph kept his promise in the spirit as well as to the letter he was a devoted husband and his wife reigned as a queen in that northern settlement where the name of higginson was a charm to con conjure with she had her model village where even the men and boys who worked in the pits were able to live with some degree of comfort she had her schools and a church of her own creation built and endowed at sir joseph's cost her cottage hospital her almshouses for the aged and helpless within that small kingdom she was worshipped as a saint and in arlington street she was able to hold her own with her contemporaries and equals in the social maelstrom while she had the proud privilege of helping three of her sisters marry creditably and comfortably and thereby to reflect honour upon the house of mountford if having married rank rather than money those ladies were inclined to look down upon their worthy brother-in-law sir joseph never allowed resentment to harden his heart or tighten his purse-strings against them or their belongings he let the husbands fish in his salmon river and shoot his pheasants and he let the wives ride his horses and recuperate their exhausted energies in the comfort of his country house he never refused to become sponsor for any of their numerous babies nor ever withheld the expected goblet or porringer of solid gold in a word he used his wealth in a large-minded fashion and succeeded in being talked of by his four sisters-in-law throughout the length and breadth of society as a dear old thing sir joseph had been married three, nearly three years when a son and heir was born in the great grey tudor house at ellerslie a son whose advent brought joy unspeakable to the father's great honest heart but this flower in the garden of domestic life was a pale and fragile blossom and drooped and withered before the end of a year in the following year there came a daughter but the father who had seen his hopes blasted was slow to let his love go out to this newcomer he was afraid of loving her too well lest he should be called upon to suffer the anguish of a second bereavement the girl baby throve however and was the delight of her mother's life the all-absorbing occupation and amusement of lady lucy's happiest years Millet's picture of mother and daughter hangs in the hall of Calander castle to which mansion it was transferred after sir joseph's death the portrait of a woman in the full flush of mature beauty with a tall willowy girl in a pinafore leaning against her mother's shoulder with sunny tresses ruffled after some childish sport and solemn dreaming eyes the eyes which shining starlight in the baby face had won for her the name of sibyl sibyl was eleven when that picture was painted and before her twelfth birthday the picture was all that remained to sir joseph of his loved and lovely 
wife she died in the pride of her strength and beauty being thrown out of the light phaeton which she had driven for years in perfect safety a nervous horse a narrow road a great coal wagon in the way and swift sudden death for the woman whom sir joseph higginson had worshipped with unwavering devotion from the hour she laid her hand in his and accepted him as her husband if she had not given him the love that youth gives to youth she had at least been true and steadfast throughout all their years of wedded life she had shown no sign of weariness or disgust she had never de depreciated her husband or hinted at her own superiority by right of early training and patrician birth she had carried with meekness and yet with dignity the power which great wealth gives to the mistress of a household her husband's life had been rounded into perfect harmony by this woman and in losing it seemed to joseph higginson as if there were nothing left for his gray hairs but to go down in sorrow to the grave he was of too tough a fibre for grief to kill he went on living somehow though the light was quenched in the lamp and the music was dead in the lute he had tried to comfort himself with the love of his daughter his only child and heiress sibyl who grew in beauty as the years ripened and waned she was very tender and devoted to him but she could not fill the empty place in his heart only one had he loved with the whole strength of his rugged nature and she was gone he took to money-making as the one pursuit that brought distraction occupation fatigue of brain and soothing sleep as a sequence of labor he had long ago made his fortune and ruled off the total of a life's industry eminently satisfied with the result but now he entered himself afresh in the race for gold and stung by the grief that gnawed his heart-strings he who had hitherto been cautious in all of his investments speculated wildly and by a curious irony of fate was successful in every enterprise during those years of his widowhood his name was a power on the stock exchange and men flung their money eagerly into any scheme in which he was interested he was said to have trebled his fortune in that headlong race to him the business of money-getting had superseded every other interest personal or general the stock exchange was his card-table and he played the game of speculation with all the passionate concentration of the habitual gambler the man who is a gambler and nothing else during this period of financial activity sir joseph lived for two-thirds of each year in arlington street preferring to be near the scene of action within a half-hour drive of the actual money market but his mines were still something to him and he spent the last of the summer months in the whole of the autumn at ellerslie park where sibyl lived with her two governesses miss minchin a homely english person who had been with her pupil from the nurse nursery days of reading lessons in words of one syllable and fraulein stahlherz an accomplished hanoverian who was familiar with almost every phrase of wagner's orchestration played all beethoven's sonatas that are playable on the pianoforte knew goethe and schiller by heart was mistress of french and italian to say nothing of english 
which she spoke more correctly than any one else at Ellerslie. Under this lady's conscientious tuition, and with the faithful mention to minister to her comforts, to look after her health, and to see that she never sat in damp boots or suffered from chilblains, that the dentist was consulted at regular intervals, and that tonics were exhibited at the least indication of languor, Sibyl had grown to eighteen years of age before it occurred to her father that she was a young woman and that she had a right to take her place in the world as his daughter. She would have to be presented at court and introduced to society, that society upon which Sir Joseph had persistently turned his back ever since his wife's death. The idea that of this necessity worried and embarrassed him. His wife's mother, Lady Allendale, was dead. Her son's wife, Lady Brymar, was a person whose house was eminently fashionable, but by no means the most fitting house for girlish innocence. Sir Joseph felt that the time was at hand when he must provide a chaperone for his daughter. There was one ready to his hand in the person of her spinster aunt, Lady Selina Mountford, a lady of small means, very well received in the best of circles, and familiar with all the works and ways of the great world. He felt the difficulty of the position all the more, because there was somebody else to be thought of at Ellerslie, a young woman who, without Sir Joseph having ever intended as much, had become, in some wise, an adopted elder sister of Sibyl's, who had shared all the privileges of Fräulein Stahlherz's erudition, and some slender portion of Miss Minchin's assiduity, and who, albeit seven years older than Sibyl, was still young enough to feel the contrast between the social importance of the great heiress and her own insignificance. A year after Lady Lucy's death, the two governesses and their pupil were startled one dull, wintry afternoon by the appearance of a mouldy, leathern vehicle, drawn by a knock-kneed bay horse, and popularly known in the district as the station fly. On the box of the station fly, and almost obscuring the driver, was a large gray trunk, metal bound and of foreign aspect. Governess and pupil stared at this phenomenon from the bay window of the spacious schoolroom, and as they stared, the elderly coachman descended painfully from his box and opened the door of the vehicle whereupon there came out of the leathern darkness a fresh face with rose-red cheeks and slow black eyes and a bush of black hair brushed upward from a broad square forehead this bright and vivid countenance was set upon the well-shaped figure of a young woman who might be at any age between eighteen and twenty-five she was tall broad-chested with finely rounded arms that showed under her close-fitting black stuff gown she was clad wholly in black a dense black which looked like deep mourning although she wore no crape her dress was plain to puritanism she must be a new housemaid said miss minchin but ball ought to know better than to bring her to the hall door Ball had dragged the stranger's trunk up the steps into the porch by this time, while the footman looked on. The newcomer disappeared within the great stone porch. Ball, the flyman, clambered onto the box. The fly drove off, and Sybil and her governesses went back to their various occupations. Fräulein, to the perusal of the last number of the Rundschau, and miss minchin to an elaborate task of needlework on her own account being the reconstruction of her last summer's sunday silk gown and sibyl 
to her practice of one of chopin's mazurkas no more was to be seen of the dark-eyed young woman for a week when sibyl met her one afternoon in a passage near the housekeeper's room they looked at each other with mutual interest open on the part of sibyl furtive on the part of the stranger could she be a servant sibyl wondered assuredly not a housemaid for the housemaids at ellerslie park all wore livery of lavender cotton in the morning and were white capped and aproned all day this young woman was capless and apronless the bloom on her cheeks had faded somewhat since the day she alighted from the station fly her dark eyes had a troubled look sibyl was on her way to the housekeeper's room to ask for something for a sick child in one of those cottages which had been her mother's kingdom and over which she now reigned a youthful queen will you send little jane barber soup once a day and jelly and custard pudding on alternate days miss morrison she asked of the comfortable-looking housekeeper whose ordinarily placid countenance was furrowed by her strenuous study of the butcher's book yes ma'am soup and jelly shall be sent poor little mite i'm afraid she's not long for this world is there anything else i can do miss sibyl mrs morrison's address fluctuated between the formal ma'am and the affectionate miss sibyl she had kept sir joseph's house when the heiress was born and worshipped her accordingly yes mrs morrison there is something i very much want you to do for me required, replied sibyl quickly tell me all about that pretty young woman in black who came here in a fly just a week ago mrs morrison's brow grew even more troubled than it had been over the butcher's book indeed miss sibyl i can't tell you much not if i was to tell you all i know the young person dropped from the clouds as one might say i hadn't had one word of notice of her coming from sir joseph or anybody else and if she hadn't brought me a letter from him i might have taken her for an impostor and turned her out of doors a letter from father do let me see it is he coming soon i am so longing for him he doesn't say a word about coming home ma'am the letter is all about the young woman let me see let me see sibyl cried eagerly holding out her hand for the letter mrs morrison had to unlock a desk and to select the sad letter from among various other documents a slow business and seeming slower to sibyl's impatience at last however the letter was produced taken out of the envelope carefully enfolded and reperused by mrs morrison before she handed it to her master's daughter sibyl read as follows the carlton thursday evening my good morrison marie arnold the bearer of this letter has been lately left an orphan and i have taken it upon myself to provide her with a home she is of humble birth and has no grand expectations it is my wish therefore that while giving her a comfortable home at ellerslie and taking her as much as possible under your own wing you should not allow her to acquire any fine notions or to fancy herself a young lady you will be kind enough to find her some light employment in the household if she is clever with her needle as i am told she is you might allow her to be useful to miss higginson and in the schoolroom generally 
i am told that she has been well educated in a convent school in the south of france where she was born she is a roman catholic i hope this fact will not be used to her prejudice and that she will be encouraged to attend the services of her own church so long as she herself desires to remember to remain a member of that church you will please provide her wardrobe and give her a reasonable amount of pocket money she will of course have a bedroom of her own and not be placed on a footing with servants yours sincerely j h not on a footing with the servants repeated mrs morrison and sibyl handed her the letter there's my difficulty you see miss find her a light occupation keep her ideas humble and yet not make a servant of her it isn't easy yes it is you dear old morrison let her be in the schoolroom and have her bedroom near the schoolroom and let her come and sit with me in my own room very often in my recreation hours i like her looks and if she is french she will help me improve my french conversation and she can tell me all about the south and she can go for long rambles with me miss minchin and the fraulein are wretched creatures to go out with neither of them knows the meaning of the word ramble they can only walk tell marie to come to my room this afternoon at half past two i am free from then till four and she and i can have a good talk not allow her to acquire fine notions or to fancy herself a lady repeated the housekeeper reading a passage from sir joseph's letter with a puzzled brow i don't know how that will hold with letting her be your companion to go out walking with you or to be with you in your sitting-room i don't know if that will quite answer to sir joseph's instructions miss sibyl but i do father means that marie and i are to be friendly or he would never have suggested her being useful in the schoolroom the schoolroom means me she shall be useful she shall help me to support the burden of two governesses that will be a work of real utility cried sibyl with a happy laugh mrs morrison had heard that joyous laughter very seldom since lady lucy's death and her heart warmed at the sound the girl had been the sunshine of the house before that bitter parting between devoted mother and adoring child but that great grief had clouded the joyous nature and for the greater part of the year of mourning it may be said that sibyl endured life rather than that she had lived the sound of her own laughter shocked her even to-day she looked down at her black frock and stifled sob oh how can i feel happy even for an instant she murmured in self-reproach when she is gone i'll send the young person to your room at half-past two precisely said mrs morrison with a cheery air and i shall be grateful to her my pretty one if she helps you to forget your loss mused mrs morrison when sibyl had gone and then the worthy woman polished her spectacles which had suddenly grown dim end of chapter 4